Well, I hope you are excited too. Uh, I'm excited about getting a dinosaur. That would be really, I don't know where we're going to put it, but we'll find a place if y'all get us one. Uh, also, I want you to know after watching that video in the first service, uh, I have made sure that the preschool park department knows whatever we have to do, no matter how much it costs, there better be puppy dog band-aids for those little babies back there. <laughs> we are getting puppy dog band-aids. So, uh, so don't you worry. We're going to have those. I, I said, you know, now Tommy's gone, so just get, take it out of music. It can be, uh, we'll, <laughs> pay for it with music. So, um, well, we are excited to spend some time together in God's Word and excited about our birthday. Our, our, this is our 79th birthday this month, and so it's, it's February, and so we always pick a time to celebrate it. We're going to celebrate it the last Sunday of this month, and it will also be a, a springboard to Mission Mobile. So uh, our, our theme this year is FETC Loves Mobile, and that's for Mission Mobile. It's for our birthday. Uh, we're asking you to take pictures around places, uh, your, your subdivision or a, a place in Mobile that's a historic place, and uh, get us those pictures. And We want to create a montage so we can just say we really do love Mobile because uh, the thing about our birthday is, you know, as you think about a 79th birthday, then you think, wow, we're, we're getting on up there, you know, but that's not the way it is for us, for a church. It's look at the years of faithfulness that we have to build upon that we can use into the future for the Lord to use us in his kingdom. So, uh, if, and this is not a trick question. If this year is our 79th birthday, then what does that mean about next year? It's our 80th birthday. So next year, we're already planning, next year is going to be a party like no other. We're going to celebrate, and we're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to celebrate the whole year, our 80th birthday next year. Uh, we'll kick it off in February and celebrate the whole year. So very excited about that. Very excited about Mission Mobile. Uh, I'm so thankful to see a church that is taking steps to become a missional church. Uh, I want you to know we are not a church that goes on mission trips. Uh, that would really be a waste of our time and resources just to go on mission trips. We're a church that has a missional strategy. That means that every trip is important and every trip is a piece of the puzzle um, in two ways. First of all, in uh, us doing our part, to take the gospel to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth, uh, but then also in our part in developing and discipling you. Because what we want is not that you would go on a mission trip. What we want is that you would learn to live missionally. And we say sometimes from across the street to around the world, but for us it's a little different from our parking lot to around the world. So we have hands-on missions opportunity right here with our community missions uh, in our parking lot. And then we want to give you opportunities in Southeast Asia, which is in a nation that we can't say publicly which nation it is, but I will tell you this, it is almost exactly on the opposite side of the world from where we are. And so we want to be involved in all of those places, but mainly what we want is to support and encourage those missionaries as they're there with those continuous missionary efforts uh, as we develop missional hearts. Because you are a missionary, and you're not just a missionary when you're on a mission trip. In fact, your primary role as a missionary is not when you're on a mission trip. It's in your everyday life. And so using these opportunities for you to learn how to do cross-cultural missions, to get out of your comfort zone, and to expand the kingdom of God, and to see God do amazing things, to pray and watch God work in direct response to those prayers, that ought to impact the way that we live our everyday lives. And with Mission Mobile coming up, I want to make it clear again, as I've said many times, uh, and we'll continue to say, um, if you want to go to Toronto or you want to go to Southeast Asia or you want to go to Atlanta or wherever, you have to participate in Mission Mobile. It's a requirement. Uh, we're just simply not going to load you up on a bus and send you to somewhere and say, now go share the gospel there when it's not something that you're doing here, you're willing to do here. So we're asking everybody to participate. If you're wondering, is Mission Mobile for me? Uh, the answer is yes, it is for you. Uh, it is not for any age group, it's for all age groups, it is for families families, it's for singles, it's for everybody in this room. There is a place for you in Mission Mobile. Even if you're watching online and your health will not permit you to come into this place, we have a way for you to be involved. We want every single person who calls First Baptist Tillman's Corner home or just visits on a regular basis. We want you to be a part of Mission Mobile. Those opportunities are coming up. You'll hear much more about them as we move along throughout the month. But I am, uh, I am very excited about Mission Mobile. And that leads me to our sermon series today. New sermon series called Vision 2024. What do we want to see God do in 2024? And so I 
this is a series where I just want to lay out some things from Scripture that I believe God has put on my heart for us to do as a church together in 2024. Just some things that I'm praying God will help us do. And it all starts with prayer. I would like to ask the Lord to help us make 2024 the year that FBTC prays more than it ever has before. That this year we pray more than we ever have before. I'm asking God to give us 2,024 hours of prayer in 2024. Now that doesn't mean you praying and you praying and you praying and we add them all up and it's 2,024 hours. No, I want us doing this in groups. Sometimes in groups this large. Uh, sometimes, but most of the time in life groups or in men with, uh, in smaller groups and our men's ministry, our women's ministry, couples going away uh, together on a prayer retreat. Um, and listen, you can go wherever you want to on a prayer retreat. You can pray in Mobile. You can also pray in the mountains. You can pray on ski slopes. So, you know what, husbands, go to your wife and say, the pastor said uh, that you've got to come deer hunting with me, you know, on Saturdays, of course, and we're going to have our prayer retreat out in the woods. But couples praying together, families praying together. I'm asking our families to think through ways that you, even with the youngest kids, even the little babies in your, uh, in your arms, how can you get away and set aside an hour and pray together in 2024. And you'll hear more about that, those opportunities as well as the year goes on. But for now, I want us to see in Scripture why prayer is so important. So we're going to be in Luke chapter 5, Luke chapter 5, and we're going to read something about Jesus that's amazing to me. As we've been reading through Luke together as a church, I kept coming across these statements about prayer. And specifically, I kept seeing mentions of Jesus praying. Now, we know Jesus prayed. But I think more than any of the other gospel authors, Luke highlights the prayer life of Jesus. There are some moments where if it weren't for Luke, we wouldn't know that Jesus had prayed in those moments. Luke chapter 5 kind of gives us a summary statement of Jesus' prayer life. Luke chapter 5 verse 16, the Bible simply says this, but he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. Now, I want you to understand that's a general statement, meaning that this is not one time where Jesus withdrew to a desolate place to pray. No, this is something that was ongoing in his life. If you were to look above in Luke chapter 5, you would see that Jesus' ministry is growing in popularity. He's just named the 12 disciples. The Bible says, and if you just back up one verse, that many crowds were routinely coming to hear him and to see him and to be healed by him. And, and so Jesus... In that season of his life, as his ministry increased, the Bible tells us that he would often withdraw. That was the pattern of his life. He would withdraw to desolate places and pray. And today's message is very simple, and it is very straightforward. If Jesus needed to pray, you need to pray. If Jesus needed to pray, I need, I need to pray, you need to pray, we all need to pray. You see, because sometimes we come to a statement about Jesus, well, Jesus was very patient. And you say, well, of course he was patient. He was the son of God. And I might say to you, well, you need to be more patient, just like Jesus was patient. And you might say to me, well, hold on now. I'm not Jesus. I can't be as patient as Jesus. After all, Jesus was the son of God. Or I might say to you, you know, Jesus memorized a lot of scripture. You need to memorize scripture. You say, well, I'm not Jesus. Jesus was the son of God. And so I can't memorize scripture because I'm not who Jesus was. But you realize it works the opposite way in praying. Jesus was the son of God. Jesus was God in the flesh. And if Jesus needed to pray, that means you and I desperately need to pray. How much more do you and I need to pray? Well, let's begin our time together in the Word by doing just that. Let's pray together. Lord, would you ignite in our hearts a passion for prayer? And Lord, would you help us that even when we're tired, even when we don't know what to say, even when it feels like we're just going through the motions. God, give us the strength to just trust you and to pray. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus needed to pray, and if he needed to pray, then you need to pray, I need to pray, we all need to pray. So how did Jesus pray? I want to highlight, here's what I want to do today. I'm going to highlight a few ways that Jesus prayed, but then I want to leave us about 10 minutes at the end of the service where we're actually going to pray. We're just going to pray. You're going to pray where you are. The altar will be open. Our prayer counselors will be here. But mainly, I just want you where you are. Just pray. Just for 10 minutes. Jesus 
prayed, how did he pray? Well, first of all, Jesus prayed regularly. He would withdraw. Remember, that's an ongoing thing. This is kind of something he would do on a regular basis. And this, to me, is especially convicting as a pastor. If Jesus were going to be here in the flesh, if Jesus, in his earthly ministry, had scheduled to stop by First Baptist Tillman's Corner today, and he were going to be here preaching and healing, how many people would be in the room? Thousands. Thousands. You say, we can't fit thousands. We could if Jesus were here. Uh, we would find a way, right? And people would be out in the parking lot and they would just try to get to, get to him just in hopes. Why? Because they're desperate. They're desperate that if they could get, just get to Jesus, then Jesus could change everything. I've often said the greatest church growth strategy that I know is to get lost people and Jesus in the same room at the same time. Uh, if you can do that, then great things happen. And we get Jesus here by praying. We get lost people here by inviting. So get Jesus in the room, and the room is packed, and there's thousands of people. And I don't know of a preacher, your pastor included, who wouldn't love to preach to a church filled with thousands of people. I don't know of a pastor who if somebody came and said, hey, listen, there are thousands out there, and they're ready to hear a message. Are you ready? I would say, let me grab my Bible. I am ready to go. Let's go do this. But what the pattern of Jesus' ministry was, what as, was as the thousands gathered... Jesus did not run to the crowd. He drew away from the crowd to get to a desolate place to pray. It's not that Jesus didn't love the crowds. Every time a crowd showed up, Jesus would teach them. Jesus would heal them. Jesus had compassion on them. But as Jesus, as the crowds ran towards Jesus, Jesus' pattern was to run away from the crowds. Why? Because he knew he desperately needed time with the Father. Jesus prayed regularly. At least eight times the Gospels record Jesus withdrawing to some place to pray. Jesus prayed regularly. He also prayed privately. So he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. This, of course, doesn't mean Jesus never prayed in public. He did pray in public. Uh, but as we know, Jesus' public prayer life was the tip of the iceberg. See, that's how it ought to be with us. Uh, I don't know what you'll do today as far as your prayer life is concerned. Hopefully in a moment you're going to spend 10 minutes praying. But maybe you would leave here and go to lunch. And maybe somebody would say to you, hey, would you mind to pray for us? And you might pray. And maybe if you were to take a stopwatch and you started praying and you hit start. And then when you finished and you said amen, you hit stop. That lunchtime prayer might be a minute and a half. Uh, if you maybe were in a life group and somebody said, hey, would you dismiss us in prayer? Hit the stopwatch. Pray. Amen. Hit the stopwatch. Maybe that's a two-minute prayer. Maybe you're going to come back tonight and be part of a D group. And maybe you're going to have some serious time of prayer. And maybe if you hit the stopwatch on that prayer, maybe that prayer might be three, four minutes long that you would pray out loud. Now, here's what I want you to see. On any given day, the amount of time that you pray out loud ought to be like the tip of the iceberg. And the mammoth amount of time that you spend in private prayer supports that public prayer. That's the way it was in Jesus' ministry. Jesus spent substantial amounts of time in private prayer so that when he opened his mouth in public prayer, he was just continuing a conversation that he had on an ongoing basis in private prayer. Jesus prayed privately. He would withdraw to desolate places and pray. The desert, the wilderness. If you've been to Galilee, then you know that there are these wide open spaces. And it's very much the way today that it was back then. There are just some spaces you can go to. There are mountains you can walk up. There are valleys you can find places to pray. And so Jesus would just make his habit uh, to find a desolate place to pray. I'm, I'm encouraged uh, by the fact that sometimes when Jesus was alone, he wasn't really alone. Luke chapter 9 verse 18, now it happened that when he was praying alone, the disciples were with him. And when I read this verse, I thought about stay-at-home moms. Stay-at-home moms who might want desperately to find a desolate place to pray. I happen to be married to a stay-at-home mom of five children, and so I know that anytime a mom goes to a desolate place to pray, or really, let's just be honest, to use the restroom, that that desolate place becomes a magnet for all the children. Suddenly, they, they feel this need to come and explain everything that they need to, to mom. So you might have a hard time finding, finding a desolate place to pray and to be all alone, but I want you to work for it. A desolate place doesn't necessarily mean you're the only person there, but I do want you to make it the habit of surrounding yourself with people whose intention is to pray. Jesus 
prayed in desolate places. He would pull the disciples to the side and say, let's go pray. That's what I want us to do all throughout the year. If you lead a group, if you lead any kind of ministry in our church, I want you to go ahead and start thinking right now, when can we set aside an hour to pray? I'm going to mention one of our ministries now because of how important their time is. Surrender. So Deanne and I were talking about this a few weeks ago, and I told her, I said, Deanne, I know that time is so important. And, and they don't have any time to give here or there. I mean, what they're doing to prepare for that tour that they're going on is so important. But as we talked about it, I said, you know, let's find an hour when they can pray. And see, for Deanne, that's a massive sacrifice because you, uh, you immediately think, well, if we have an hour with surrender, then we've got to get everything just right. We've got to remember the solos, and we've got to remember who's doing this and who's doing that and who's coming in at this time and that time. But as we understand as a staff, and I'm using surrender because whatever your ministry is, here's what I'm saying. If surrender can give up an hour to pray, your ministry can give up an hour to pray. And so as important as your gathering is, Life group leaders, as important as your teaching is, uh, those of you who work in children's ministry, as important as it is that you spend time memorizing and reciting Scripture, nothing will be more powerful than setting aside time and saying, what we will do in this time is we will pray. So if you lead a ministry, if you lead a group, if you're a part of a group, Start thinking now how you can make prayer part of your life. If you are a parent, start thinking now how can our family in 2024 withdraw to desolate places and pray. If you're a husband, start thinking now how can my wife and I pull away to desolate places and pray. And we want to provide you with resources as you think about this. Go ahead and start making the plans. We will provide you with resources on how to do this. Jesus prayed privately. He set aside time to be alone with the Father, or to be with those who were close with him that were focusing on the Father. Jesus prayed regularly. He, pr he prayed privately. Jesus prayed intensely. He would withdraw to desolate places. And what would he do? He would pray. Now, as a kid and a teenager, I was so blessed to be a part of churches who taught me the Word. I never... In my life, did it occur to me that a man would stand up on a stage like this, behind a pulpit like this, and do anything other than open the Bible and teach me what it says? I realize now that, that by the way, that, that happens in a lot of places. But just in my experience, I, di I didn't know that happened. I didn't know that somebody would stand up in a pulpit and give their opinion or, uh, you know, say something about Scripture and maybe say that they weren't sure that this is true or not. I mean, all I knew were men who preached the Word, and I'm very thankful for that. I'm very thankful for the way that the churches that I was raised in invested in me and, um, and all of the great things that they did for me. But one thing I noticed as a kid is, as the churches that I was involved in as a kid uh, that were fantastic churches, but... Uh, also the churches that I was involved in that my friends went to. We had something called prayer meeting. Y'all ever been to prayer meeting? Now let's get our stopwatch out again. In a typical Baptist prayer meeting, if we hit start when the prayer begins and we hit stop when the prayer ends, out of a one-hour prayer meeting, how much prayer takes place? Somewhere around two minutes. Typical prayer meeting, I've been in many of them, goes something like this. Hey, welcome everybody. Hope you're doing well. Anybody got any prayer needs? And then for 55 minutes, we talk about prayer needs. The person leading the prayer meeting, sometimes the pastor, I've led these prayer meetings, looks down and goes, oh my, we've, we're almost out of time. Brother such and such, would you pray for us? And brother such and such says, dear God, I can't remember everything that's been said tonight, but I know you've heard and you know the names and you know the details. Dear God, bless all these people in Jesus' name, Amen. One hour. And in those prayer meetings, about one minute and 30 seconds worth of prayer. Jesus, his prayer time was very different. When Jesus went alone to pray, he prayed intensely. He would withdraw to desolate places, and what did he do? He prayed. The Bible says in Luke chapter 6, verse 12, in those days, who went out to the mountain to pray, and all night, he continued in prayer to God. It's pretty intense prayer. This is just before he chose the disciples. He had a big decision to make. Now again, he's Jesus, right? I mean, Jesus has got a decision to make. Certainly, he doesn't need to pray. 
He spent all night before he chose his disciples. Pastor, I got a big decision come up. Well, you ought to pray. I'm good. I just need you to tell me what God wants me to do. <laughs> well, maybe you should pray. Well, certainly God wouldn't want me to spend all night in prayer. He might. One of the things I want to do this year at least once is, is have an all-night prayer meeting. I want us to show up somewhere around 10 o'clock at night, and I want us to leave when the sun comes up the next morning. Now, I'm already saying, Lord, you know I can't stay awake all night, so I'm going to need you to keep me up all night so I can pray all night. I realize it's going to be an act of prayer just to get there, and we're going to have different things you can do. So there'll be prayer stations. There'll be prayer walking. There will be prayer jumping jacks. And about 3 a.m., that's what I'll be doing, prayer jumping jacks. Lord, I pray that you would help us as we get ready for this next mission trip or whatever we're doing, whatever I happen to be praying about. It's going to be hard, to, and we're going to feed you breakfast as soon as the sun comes up. Uh, so if those of you who survive, you get, uh, you get the breakfast. We're going to put that on the on the calendar. But Jesus said, I need to actually pray. I need to pray all night. That's an intense prayer. No prayer more intense than the prayer in the garden. Luke chapter 22, the Bible says, when he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And when he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, he knelt down and prayed. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. That's intense prayer. The Son of God needed to pray intensely, so intensely that his sweat would become like great drops of blood. You and I are more like the disciples. We fall asleep while Jesus is praying. But you know what? God is gracious. And God understands. I've gotten sleepy many times when I'm praying. The Lord understands that. I've asked God for help. Lord, help me stay awake. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Jesus prayed intensely. Not only did Jesus pray intensely, Jesus prayed specifically. He had a, a pattern or a plan. Luke chapter 11 verse 1, the Bible says that he was praying in a certain place, and when he had finished, one of the disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. And it's as has been pointed out many times, the disciples never said to Jesus, Lord, teach us to preach. They never said to him, Lord, teach us how to heal. He, they, the one request they made of him is, Lord, teach us to pray. They heard Jesus praying. They understood the source of his power and ministry was prayer. And the one thing they asked him to teach them was to pray. Lord, teach us to pray. In response to that, Jesus gave us the Lord's Prayer, right? And so Jesus said, pray when you pray in this way. And it's a model prayer. It's a model prayer because there are other times that Jesus prays and he doesn't pray that exact prayer. And we see other passages in Scripture that help us uh, know how to pray. But the Lord's Prayer is a model prayer. It's a good guide for us. You don't have to pray exactly like that every time that you pray. But on the back of your uh, listening guide... I've put a guide based on the Lord's Prayer because most of us know the Lord's Prayer, so that's the advantage of it. Even if you've never memorized any scripture in your life, probably somewhere along the way you've picked up the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. You know the Lord's Prayer. And so as you think through the Lord's Prayer, it gives you a pattern for prayer. It gives you a place to start. So you start with praise, our Father in heaven. I can tell you from personal experience, you can spend an hour praying over that phrase. Our Father in heaven. Just the word our. Our Father. How many times when we're praying do we forget that we are praying to a God who is a collective God of all of his people? Our Father. When I come to my Father, I'm praying to the Father of every person in this room who's a follower of Christ, every person watching online who surrendered their life to Jesus, all the people all across the city of Mobile who are gathered today who know the name of Jesus and who follow Jesus, and all the people all over the world who are gathered today on this Lord's Day to worship the Lord, I am praying to a father of a great family, and I can get caught up on that because that's an amazing truth. Our Father. You are our Father. And you're not just my Father individually so that I can say, uh, my Father who is in heaven, would you please fix my brother or sister in Christ because they got major problems. Our Father. Oh, He is our Father. That's my spiritual sibling. I'm not right with him. Lord, help me to be right with my brother or sister in Christ. Our Father. He's our Father. He is the one who provides for us, protects us. He's 
a father to you in the same way that you are a father to your children or a mother to your children. He cares about you. He wants the best for you. You don't always understand what he's doing, but he is your father. He's the perfect father. And he's the perfect father where many of you didn't have a perfect father. You can spend an hour praying about that. Thank you, God, that you are the father that I never had. Or thank you, God, for being a heavenly father and giving me a gift of my earthly father. And thank you, Lord, for all the ways that even though I had a great earthly father, you do so much more for me. Our father, who is in heaven. See, it makes a difference where your father is, doesn't it? It makes a difference when you put in a call to your father where your father is and what his position is and what he's able to do. Well, our father is in heaven. So you, you begin with praise. Our father in heaven. We've written a prayer there that'll kind of help you know some things you could pray based off of that. Then those three declarations. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Those are, those are all statements of reality, but they're also prayers. Lord, your kingdom come. Your kingdom is coming. His kingdom is coming, but Lord, I need it to come right here in my heart, just like we prayed earlier. Here in my heart. Lord, bring your kingdom here. Your will be done here. This is where it starts. And then it moves out to those other folks who you're praying for, and you start to pray for God's will to be done. Somebody you're praying for to be healed, start with prayer. Your will be done, Father. Your kingdom come. Your will be done right there in that person's life. Before you get to give us this day our daily bread, start with your will, Father. Your kingdom, Father. Then you move to these three requests. I want you to notice out of these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven ways that we've broken this down, and there are other ways to break down the Lord's Prayer, but it's always the same result. Whether you break it down into seven parts or eight parts or as many as 12 parts. You can break it down, probably even more. Only one of them has to do with a physical need. Again, compare that to our prayers. Our prayers, we want, we want to run straight to the physical needs. Now God says, ask for the physical needs. Jesus says, ask him. Give us this day our daily bread. But even in asking, we're already stating that we know he's going to do it. Give us this day our daily bread. Provide for me what I'm going to need today. God, I know you're going to do it. I know you're going to do that. I just want to acknowledge it comes from you. Give us this day our daily bread. Then it moves right back to the spiritual. Forgive me as I forgive those who have sinned against me and then protect me from temptation. Here is your pattern for prayer. This is what I want you to use. Now, you may not need this. This is to help you in just a moment when we, we're going to set a timer. We're going to look up at the clock and, and set aside 10 minutes to pray. And so this will help you get through, uh, work your way through those 10 minutes. Jesus prayed specifically. He had a plan. Jesus in his ministry prayed for some specific needs. He taught his disciples to pray specifically that they would not fall into temptation. He prayed for the cup to pass from himself. And he prayed for the selection of his disciples for wisdom in choosing the right ones. Jesus prayed with a plan and he prayed specifically. Over 20 years ago, Lindsay and I were engaged and we wanted to do some Bible studies together before we got uh, married. And during that engagement period, one of the studies we did was by Charles Stanley on prayer. And I don't remember much about the study itself, but I'll never forget when it came to the end of the study, Charles Stanley said this, when all is said and done about prayer, more is said than done. And I thought of all the things I'd learned about prayer throughout my 20 years, 23 years or so of life at that time. I thought, boy, that is so true. It would be a mistake, I think, to come to church this morning, talk about how important prayer is, how prayer is more important than anything else we would do, but not set aside time to pray. So we're going to give you 10 minutes to pray. I had someone tell me after first service that as they went into this 10 minutes to pray, they got really convicted because they said, I have to admit, after about a minute or two, it was kind of hard. But then, boy, I was instantly convicted because I thought, how easy it is for me to waste 10, 20, or 30 minutes scrolling through other people's problems, watching some video of something that I'm going to forget about next week. But 10 minutes of prayer was hard. Well, listen, my... If you'll dive in in 2024, at the end of 2024, 
10 minutes will not be hard for you. 10 minutes will go by in a flash. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to have our regular response time. We're going to have a time uh, where you can come forward and pray for any need that you have. And we're going to sing together. We're going to sing, Lord, I need you. Uh, but then after about a verse or two, uh, we're, we're going to continue to have the altars open. Our prayer counselors will be here and our pastors will be here. And so you can come forward, whatever need you have, especially if you need to be saved. The, the prayer that you need to pray if you need to be saved is the prayer of repentance and placing your faith in Jesus Christ. That's the prayer you need to pray. And we would love to walk you through what that looks like and share the gospel in more detail with you and walk you through what it's like to have a relationship with God. Because if you don't know the Lord, you don't have access to the throne room of God. But if you know Jesus, then over the next few moments, you have opportunity to enter into the presence of God and speak to him about anything you want to. So as we spend this time in prayer after those couple of verses, then I'm, I'm going to come back and ask you to be seated right where you are. Use this. Use this as a guide. Look, if you're totally confused and lost, raise your hand. I'll come help you. Spend 10 minutes with the Lord. As we were doing this in the first service, it, it hit me that most of the time, prayers for us are like speed bumps. They slow us down on the way to what we're trying to get to. That's what a blessing is, right? I mean, look, y'all have all been there when somebody's praying a little too long over the food, right? You've been there. You go, okay, man, all right, any time now, the food's getting cold. It's like a speed bump. And you know it's just going to be over, and any, any moment now it's going to be over, and they're going to say amen, and we can move on. This is different. Ten minutes. You got ten minutes. When's the last time you had ten minutes just cleared off for you, and you didn't have anything else to do, and just for ten minutes you could focus on the Lord? Right here today is your opportunity. Do not miss this opportunity. This was a powerful time in our first service, and I'm praying to God that it would be a powerful time in this service. Just spend ten minutes with God. Relax, calm down, don't be anxious over this. Just spend ten minutes with the Lord. Would you pray with me as we move into a time of invitation? Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the pattern you've given us in Jesus. Lord, if he needed to pray, we desperately need to pray. And Lord, that's what I want us to do today. All across the room, would you give us the opportunity just to spend time praying? Lord, I pray you would open people's hearts to pray in ways they haven't prayed in years. Lord, I pray for someone here today who doesn't know you. That they would pray that first and most important prayer, that prayer of submission and repentance to you. God, guide this time. Fill this place with your spirit. Do your work in our lives. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand?